Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is episode number 21 uh, on the subject of heaven. Now, if you haven't seen the previous 20 episodes, uh, you'll find them on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, each episode is two hours long, so we've already been discussing heaven for 40 hours. <laughs> and, you know, the your first reaction might be, that sounds kind of crazy. How could you talk about heaven for 40 hours? Uh, well, I hope you'll go back and watch the all the episodes. Take your time and, and gradually go through it all because there's a lot to be said and there's a lot to learn about heaven. And really, as we've been going through this study, uh, of all the different studies I've done over the years, uh, there's no topic I've ever found that has made me so happy as this one is studying heaven, what we have to look forward to in eternity. So uh, before we get started here, uh, let me ask the panelists to introduce themselves and say hi. Uh, Brother Eric. Hi everybody, Eric here, Jesus Knight 72 happy and blessed to be here as always. Okay, thank you Eric. And uh, Brother Austin. Hey everybody, this is Austin. Uh, my channel's name is Austin Bell and I run an online ministry here called Christ Ministries and I'm glad to be here. Okay, very good. Let me get my special effects up here. Uh, I don't want to miss the, the opportunity to use those whenever possible. Uh, okay. That's, uh, the, the, I guess the whole world's watching and applauding you guys and thanking you for, for participating. <laughs> okay, we're going to... Um, uh, oh, by the way, uh, I should have mentioned that the source material we're using for this study uh, is the Holy Bible and uh, this book by Randy Alcorn titled Heaven by Randy Alcorn. Uh, we've been working our way through his book, and uh, as we're going discussing each one of these uh, uh, topics about heaven, uh, Randy Alcorn in his book uh, uses the technique of uh, asking a lot of questions and then providing an answer and basing it on most of it on scripture and some of it on uh, just speculation. So uh, we're just reading uh, his questions and his answers and discussing it. Uh, we're going to right now we're going to chapter 29 and the uh, title of chapter 29 is what will our bodies be like? Um, one of the things we like about Randy's book is that uh, not only does every chapter uh, start with a question, but within each chapter there's probably you know eight or ten mother, other questions. Uh, so a lot of these questions are things that we've all wondered and asked ourselves and maybe been curiously asked other people. So uh, here's what he says. Will we all have beautiful bodies? I heard someone say that in heaven we'll all have sculpted bodies without any fat. The comment reflects a yearning for our bodies to be healthy, fit, and beautiful. I expect our bodies will be good looking, but not with a weightlifting, artificial implant, skin tuck, tanning boot sort of beauty. The sculpted physique. Uh, our culture admires would be regarded as freakish in other places and times. Some cultures consider that uh, what we call slimness as unhealthy and what we consider plumpness as a sign of vitality and prosperity. The same genetic tendencies that make some people unattractive by one culture's standards make them attractive in another. I, our new bodies, I expect, will have a natural beauty that won't need cosmetics or touch-ups. As for fat, because God created fat as part of our bodies, we'll surely have some, but in healthy proportions. Well, that's a, that's a mouthful already, he said about that. Uh, I mean, <laughs> how many people are going to like even analyze it that closely and say, uh, how, fat, how fat will we be? How much body fat will we have? Are we going to get these skin calipers out and test everybody's body fat in heaven and see if you have you know ten or twelve percent, or or is it way too much in twenty percent? You know. <laughs> uh, 
I, what do you think of his idea that uh, you know maybe what we consider to be uh, uh, ideal uh, figures for women and physiques for men uh, may not be what uh, you know how maybe Adam and Eve were. Maybe Adam, Adam and Eve's bodies in the Garden of Eden was, is, the, is the prototype that uh, we, we should be looking for. Agreed. Um, I think that, um, but of course we can't know what their bodies were like. We don't know. Um, so, I mean, it's an interesting question because it's not one that really I really hear people talk about much. I mean, I do hear a mention as far as being healthy and looking healthy as far as age. That's the biggest one I see people talk about. How old do you think we'll be? We mentioned that a little bit. But um, to me, it's kind of like I have an answer to that question. I, it's not necessarily the right one, but there is a possibility, and there's a possibility that your body is going to be something made specifically for you, so it will be designed for whatever you think your idea of what most pleasing your body would be. I mean, so to you, it would suit each person accordingly. Wow, look at that. <laughs> I never would have come up with that. I think that is a beautiful answer. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, obviously, if we're going to be you know, happy and full of joy all the time, uh, if I had a body that I didn't like, I don't know how happy I could be, you know, if, if my body wasn't something that, that you know, was pleasing to me. And so, yeah, and maybe each person's uh, opinion of what an ideal body will be, should be is what they'll have. I mean, I've never heard anybody speculate. I don't know if Randy Alcorn even comes up with that. I think that's a, I don't really, know. <laughs> a really interesting concept. What do you think, Austin? I think that, uh, like our brother Eric said, but I also think, too, is that there's always... <clears throat> Every individual believer, there's a lot of people that see beauty in a lot of different ways. Uh, that could go with preference, sexual attraction, anything. There's always something different for every person. So I think that what one person would seem would be fit for their idea would be different for another. So this would go with Brother Eric's. So I think that it's going to it's going to depend on that person's own unique personality and perception of how they deem fit and worthy to be broadened by their body. Mm -hmm. So if, if that was the case then, we would not have everybody with exactly the same physiques. In other words, we're not, you're not thinking that, that uh, God has a model of a body for every man and every woman, and every woman has an identical female body, every man has an identical male body. Um, that would be if God chose a body for us, uh, but Eric's putting forth the idea that no, maybe we get to choose our own idea of what a perfect body is, and uh, I, I like that idea. I'm, I'm not sure uh, if we can find any scripture except that you know the fact that we're going to be full of joy, as I pointed out. I do know that if one thing to support this is that if we all have our own unique personality, I don't see why we wouldn't have our own unique body. Yeah. Now I have a I have a a nephew who's been a champion bodybuilder and he spent many many years lifting weights and getting his body sculpted as the way Randy is describing in this book here and he, he has a, a large gym full of weights and stuff and worked real hard at it and so he has his idea of what he think is a perfect physique that he's worked hard to try to attain and uh, if he was given some real thin slender body uh, or maybe a body that has a little more body fat, body fat and not as much definition, uh, maybe he'd be very disappointed. <laughs> you know? That's possible. Yeah. I think another uh, one other interesting thing about that point of view, and this is sort of like a maybe there's a hint of it is you know when when God uh, you know came down to take form in the person of Jesus Christ, um, it doesn't say that God's impression of a person in Jesus as the perfect person was a super muscular, uh, ultra-athletic. It doesn't describe Jesus that way. In fact, most things describe Jesus as an average man. You know, um, you don't get the impression he was that way. A super. I mean, yes, he was a son of a carpenter, and he had a physical body, which would have um, gone along the lines with that kind of physical work, and he was probably in good shape. But it didn't, it didn't you know, the, I think the Bible would have made some kind of point that people wouldn't look at him and notice him to be this person of, you know, bodybuilding physique if that was God's impression of what was perfect or what God's impression of the way it should be, and I don't think um, 
there's nothing to insinuate that. So it doesn't, it, like you said, it doesn't insinuate there's any one way that God sees is perfect in that way. Well, the only thing that I can recall uh, in Scripture that actually describes what Jesus looked like, I believe it's in uh, either in uh, Psalms or in Isaiah, and it describes him as being uh, very ordinary and unattractive. Nothing about him was was like right. really attractive that would right that, that stood out as a right exactly exactly. Okay, uh, I did. Course, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say I did remember one thing. I remember too is that. To support this also is that when Moses asked what uh, who God was, and he's, he said in Exodus 3.14, I, you know, he's the great I am, that to me always said that God was saying, just be yourself. Like God was being himself, and how he was displaying is like, yeah, I'm just, I just exist. So I think that could go along the line of how we are, just be yourself. Because like, we always hear that in school and life, you know, just be yourself, stop trying to be something you're not. So I think that could also go with how our body will be, is just to be ourselves how we are. I mean, like, there's reasons why we're all different now based on race and uh, different sex and different uh, things we do with our bodies, but we're all different already coming into the world, so I don't see why when we leave that would change. Yeah, and another thing, we've, we've mentioned this uh, in prior uh, episodes, is that uh, uh, our desires are, are probably will be different too, uh, in that maybe we won't have the kind of ego or pride or even narcissism that uh, that we many of us have now and, and the idea of how your body looks may not even be an important uh, thing at all in our own minds that's interesting exactly. okay he says the most beautiful person you've ever seen is under the curse a shadow of the beauty that once characterized humanity if we saw Adam and Eve as they were in Eden they would likely take our breath away. If they would have seen us as we are now, they likely would have been filled with shock and pity. <laughs> well, that's an interesting point. I'll stop right there here. Um, again, I, I, this is an example of, you know, uh, Randy's entitled to his opinion, just as Eric is entitled, I'm entitled. We're entitled to opinions and to our speculation. Sure. Uh, and then and a lot of the things that we come up with, we, we have good scripture to back up our opinion. Uh, but I, I don't know. I'm not sure if, um, um, you know, we can support what he just said there through any scripture. Uh, I do think, though, that if Adam and Eve, which I imagine that their bodies were perfect as far as perfect health and the way God wanted them to be, uh, but for them to look at us, uh, there's such a broad range of humanity. You have a lot of people that, that I think are, uh, they wouldn't be shocked. Even though they're under the curse, they still uh, have beauty and they have, uh, you know, a healthy, uh, healthy body. And then they have other people that are, are emaciated from, you know, uh, a lack of food or, or a drug addictions, and then other people that are morbidly obese that uh, that would be shocked. Uh, Adam and Eve would probably be shocked by seeing. But there's a lot of people today that I think that uh, there's obviously a lot of beautiful people in the world today. Well, there's another thing to consider there. I, I don't think that idea is really right at all. I don't think they'd be shocked. People forget. They kind of go back to the story of Adam and Eve, and they think of Adam and Eve in regards to that instance and that time of that time period. But Adam and Eve lived for a very long period of time under the curse, so they knew, they saw their children, their children's children, and under the curse, I'm sure they were coming. You know, there's some of them were fat, some of them were muscular, some of them. Were, so yeah. I, I don't think it, I don't think it would have been strange to them. They lived for a very long time, seeing people under the curse and seeing the different shapes yeah. people were going to be in. So. That's true. Very good point. Uh, God will decide what our perfect bodies look like, but we certainly shouldn't assume they'll all look alike. Different heights and weights seem as likely as uh, different skin colors. Racial identities will continue. Um, Revelation 5.9 and 7.9. Could you look that up, Eric? Sure. Revelation 5.9 and 7.9. Uh, and this involves a genetic carryover from the old body to the new. I'm speculating, but it seems likely that people whose bodies were tall will have tall resurrection bodies. Those who were short will likely be short. The naturally thin will be thin, and the naturally thick will be thick. Uh, but all of these sizes will be healthy and appealing, untouched by the curse or disease or restrictions, and will each be perfectly happy with the form God designed for us. 
again, it's, it's, it's all very speculative and theoretical on, on his part with no scripture to really go to, unless this revelation tells us. What does it say? Uh, revelation chapter 5, 9 says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation. And in Revelation 7, 9, it says, After I beheld this, after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So it does seem to insinuate there that you're seeing these people in their different physical ways. We see them as different nations. You know, they're different, the different racial, ethnic, different ethnicities, and different things that make us different as nations. Yeah, it does seem to to lead to if that. You, uh, you know, if if I was. Uh, uh, resurrected, and I didn't look anything like I do now, as far as uh, let's say my race or my uh, a facial, or, you know, my face or anything. You'd wonder I'm, would I even know it's me? Would anybody else know it's me? You know, uh, you'd have to assume that you're going to be the same race and 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 look similar to how you do now. Uh, but uh, maybe you know my broken nose and other things, you know, I, I won't have that. I had a beautiful little nose when I was a kid, you know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, some people consider this topic unspiritual, but one of the church's greatest theologians, Augustine, didn't. He says in the City of God, quote, the body shall be of that size which is either which it either had attained or should have attained in the flower of its youth, and shall enjoy the beauty that arises from preserving symmetry and uh, proportion in all its members. Overgrown and emaciated persons uh, need not fear that they shall be in heaven of such a figure as they would not be given be even in this world if they could help it. Uh, Again, uh, I mean, it all it all makes sense, but we don't have any scripture to go to to really, uh, you know, declare that really, do we? No, I, I don't think so. And it's interesting that Augustine wrote about such a thing, huh? So some of these things here we're talking about. I mean, you know, how many? <laughs> when did Augustine live? Around uh, three hundred or something? Yeah, well, I think you know, for, for to make the comment, some people consider this topic unspiritual. Why? I mean, why is that unspiritual? Why is it unspiritual to consider these things? I mean, it just—I don't know. It just—it seems to me like people will leap at anything they can to not talk about something by saying, "Well, that's just not spiritual. That's not—you know—that's that's that's yeah. not biblical. It's not." Spiritual. Well, I mean, I've had some experience with people that. Uh, uh, would would agree that this it was even speculating on this, thinking about it is unspiritual. Uh, there's even some people I really care about on YouTube that their viewpoint on on heaven and what, everything we've been, been discussing is totally contrary to all the things that we've concluded. Uh, so and they, they, they part of that is this Christoplatonism again. Mm -hmm. And and uh, let's take the, let's take this chance to define what that word is because I think that is really the problem with people. Uh, their attitude towards heaven and and thinking that maybe these this kind of a discussion is even unspiritual. But wh why would you define Christoplatonism as Randy Alcorn uh, put it in his book? Well, it's it's the same as and we've talked about this many times. But real quick, for a person seeing this video in particular, it, Christoplatonism falls in line the ideas of Gnosticism, which is the the basic idea is that spiritual things are good and physical things are bad. So it's irrelevant to those people. Physical things won't exist, and they seem to be more of the mindset that heaven is going to be this ethereal thing that's there's no physicality to it, and it's just strictly spirit uh, strictly spirit uh, realm type of thing. Um, and we're kind of saying, no, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches clearly that there are reasons to believe, many reasons to believe that there are physicalities to eternity and to the new heaven and new earth. Yes. Yeah, so the idea of, of uh, Greek philosophy, the, of, of Plato, and, uh, and Gnostic philosophy uh, has uh, early on infiltrated into the, the church's uh, theologies and made people think that the idea of... Um, 
being having a physical existence in eternity is is bad because physical matter is bad and it has to be a non-physical spiritual realm. Therefore, we're not going to even have bodies and and plus it's very unspiritual to even think about how how you're going to look. You know. <laughs> All right. Um, we won't. Uh, he says we won't overeat or undereat on the new earth. With health, vitality, and freedom, we'll all get plenty of activity. Will calories affect us the same way they do now? I don't know, but we certainly won't experience heart disease, diabetes, asthma, osteoporosis, arthritis, cancer, MS, HIV, or anything else that consumes the body. Uh, and he says, no more insulin injections for me. That's Randy Alcorn's personal statement. He's happy. <laughs> I guess he has diabetes. So uh, uh, we won't overeat. Uh, I guess he's – how could he come to that conclusion? What would you, he base that on, you think? Well, the one thing I would say is he makes a comment there with health, vitality, freedom, we'll all get plenty of activity. But really health is a relative thing. I mean, we know the Bible tells us specifically that when we go, when eternity begins, um, the new heavens and new earth, there will be no death. You can't get sick. There's no pain. You can't die. You can't, so health becomes really a moot point at that point because you, you can't die. You can't get sick. Yes. So even if you tried to overeat, it seems to me it would be pointless because it wouldn't have an effect on you because – you wouldn't get into a, a, a position of unhealthiness because you can't be unhealthy. Yeah. Uh, and then it gets back to our desires, too. Maybe our desires for food will be different. We're going to talk a lot more later about, you know, uh, feasting and foods and eating in eternity, but uh, the idea of, of us being, like, obsessed with food and we get uh, gluttonous and, and, and we, get, we overdo this and make almost – food and idol where we're just in love with food I think Solomon said uh, uh, eat to live don't live to eat uh, and maybe that will be our attitude we'll, we'll eat because we need it plus but I do think that we'll enjoy it because there's too much talking about feasting in the term detail. right I, I, I have a different take on that which is that we'll simply eat food for the enjoyment of the various tastes of it. It's just one of those enjoying things that we'll be able to do. Um, food affects us adversely here, and that's also part of the fall. I mean, that's part of the curse. Um, things don't operate the way they're supposed to. Um, so everything is in a fallen state. You know, that includes things we consume. It includes our cells, our, you know, everything about us. So in that regard, I think when we consume food in heaven and into eternity, it'll simply be for the enjoyment of such things. Yes. Real fast yeah. to touch on this, would this also include uh, the tree of, <clears throat> of life or whatever? There's 12 different fruits on there, right, for each different month? Uh-huh. What are those fruits that we have here now? Are they... Even heavenly fruits. Uh, it doesn't specify what the fruits are, but uh, we're going to be discussing the the, the river of, uh, in the New Jerusalem and the tree of life and all that stuff and, and as we go along here. But but for now, the the question is, um, will people be eating for pleasure and not because of a, a, the necessity of nutrition, uh, or or will it be the other way around where? We're, we're not eating for pleasure, but only eating because uh, we need certain foods uh, for, our, for our bodies. And, I, think then, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think it's for pleasure because, uh, you know, I, I think God wouldn't have put taste buds or God wouldn't have made flavor to food if it wasn't to be enjoyed. I mean, if everything was just, if all we need to do is just to have it to, to, to stay alive, I don't see the purpose of why there's flavors. And then another reason. That was a really tasty, tasty answer you gave me. Delicious. <laughs> Absolutely. One thing, though, I'm excited to is that I believe there'll be a lot of new foods there. Because, uh, again, uh, sure. heaven and manna, the, the food that was fed with the uh, Israelis in the desert for 40 years, I think that'd be that'd be a new food. And I think there'll be also others to include in that. So it's like an exciting surprise, including with the pleasures of eating. 
Well, that's a good, that's a great point, Austin. Make and and to go along with that, Austin. There's another side of that. In fact, I've used that very statement you said many times. It was great that you pulled that out. I'm glad you said it. Um, you know, God would not have given food taste if He didn't want it to be something for us to enjoy. You know, it's something for us. We savor. You know, I mean. I mean, I know as far as I'm concerned, there's a lot of people out there eat a lot of you know, you know, vegetables and things of that nature. But when I smell a steak going on the grill, I mean, I start salivating. I start, you know, because it just it's, it smells so good, you know. Um, so these things, even, even when we haven't gotten to taste them yet, we smell them and it's so good. But there is so much that, that has been done with food through the ages that we couldn't possibly as human beings ever try all the ways food's been done. But that's going to be interesting. Maybe in heaven we will be able to try all these millions of ways food's been done, <laughs> to all these different recipes and things that people have created. Who knows? Maybe that'll be something that'll be another new yeah. uh, enjoyment experience. Well, uh, I think that's a maybe an important point to consider is that uh, look how much effort has gone throughout all civilization, civilizations in terms of food preparation and culinary and, and uh, being cooking food and preparing it and chefs. Uh, today is very common that, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, the idea of preparing food in a way that is maximizing your enjoyment of it is, is a really big thing. And I imagine it's, it's always been that way. People tried to uh, find ways to prepare it uh, so that it's, the best way to enjoy it, and if, if is that a bad thing in any way? And if that's something that people have strived to learn and develop, then uh, maybe that's part of man's culture that will be retained. Is uh, you know we will we will have a lot of different ways of preparing food still. I mean, well, I, I think I, I think that's a good point, Luke. And one of the things that I think is you know food is one of the great types of artistic expression in our culture. I mean, really. Food turns out the best because, and this is coming from a guy who's a cook. You know, I love to cook, and it, it's it's there's a lot of love that goes into it, and there's a, it's it's really more an art than it is just a chemistry. It's not as simple as simply throwing things together, or else everybody would make it the same way and it would taste great, but everybody can't quite do it. There's a lot of artistic expression and and just loving care that goes into when you cook, and it's it's funny because I just I've always seen that as one of the things that God has. Has stimulated our imagination to do. Uh, in fact, in in the scripture, when they would burn things like the sacrifices, it says the aroma would be pleasing to God. It was a, a pleasing aroma to His smell uh, to Him. So that can be taken that it was good because the sacrifice was good, but it could also be taken good because it did smell good to Him because He He smelled this is a good thing. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I like the idea that every culture and every race has their own. Uh, culinary traditions, uh, you know, they all have their special take on food as it is. So I think that is a their key concept too is that it is for pleasure because you know it's cool to see too how we come together as society as a whole or in general as the, as the world, mankind, that we can see how one culture will hold true to this food while this culture thinks it's bizarre. But it can food is like a universal language; you can unite people. By, uh, by food, and I think it's welcomed among all cultures of society of how we prepare it. It's cool and interesting to find out. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Jesus, uh, you know, he, he broke bread. He, he did the, uh, the Passover meals, and, and uh, uh, it, there's, there's nothing ever negative expressed in the Bible about, uh, you know, preparing food and enjoying food. The only thing is, again, in... in uh, in Proverbs, of course, there's talking. It talks about gluttony, and you know, people can go overboard with, uh, you know, became, becoming obsessed and basic, basically, basically, this form of idolatry where you're just worshiping, mm -hmm. just loving food, and at the at the expense of everything else, and then yep. it, it costs you your health. Yeah. Um, most people aren't longing so much for a perfect body as for the sense of well-being and approval they think God goes with it. Of this we can be certain, no matter what we look like, our bodies will please the Lord, ourselves, and others. We won't gaze into the mirror wishing for a different nose or a diff different cheeks, ears, or teeth. The sinless beauty of the inner person will overflow into the beauty of the outer person. We'll feel neither insecurity nor arrogance. We won't attempt to hide or impress. We won't have to try to look beautiful. We will be beautiful. We'll be most grateful, not 
uh, not about our appearance, but our health and strength. We'll know that the artist fashioned us just as he desired and that we'll never lose the health and beauty he's graciously given us. Um, again, I don't, I don't find any fault with his, uh, that paragraph, uh, but I don't, I don't have anything clearly stated in Scripture that, that actually states it. We, we just have to surmise it based upon the fact that we're going to be so happy. Uh, and there'll be no more sickness, no more death, and, and, and if we're going to be happy and healthy, then uh, how could a person be happy if they had, let's say they went through life with uh, some uh, physical feature, maybe even a deformity, uh, and they, they, they hated it, and they were uh, uh, people like uh, were mocking them and making fun of them because of it. Uh, I, obviously, if they had that in heaven, Maybe that's something that they they wouldn't be happy about having. So if if they're going to be happy, maybe they couldn't have that situation. So I I can see how, you know, you can use deductive logic and and come to this conclusion, but I I don't know of any scripture that that says what he just said in that paragraph. Uh, well, I also like the uh, the the premises of inner beauty is the one is the true thing that matters. I think here while on earth, you know, we'll, there's always something. Everybody's lacking in something, and I think that's. That's just God's unique uh, sign to show mankind that it's a reminder to show that we fell from perfection. You know, we we fell from being. Perfect. And it's everybody has something that they don't like or something that they lack, and I think that's just to show you that it's just a reminder to show that we fell from that. But now with Christ and salvation through Him, we'll re again will be restored to that perfect stat. So. For right now, I think all that matters is not necessarily how an individual looks on on the outside. It, it all comes down to how they deal with things on the inside. Yeah, uh, probably the person in history that uh, is famous and known for his, um, I guess I could use the word hideous appearance, is, is the character known as the Elephant Man. Mm -hmm. He had that disease. It was a horrible deformity. Mm -hmm. Um, and what a beautiful movie it was, a story about inner beauty of that person. Uh, and yet um, he, his appearance was, was horrible and, and frightening to people to, to look at. Um, but maybe would the elephant man have that appearance in heaven? Uh, and because in heaven no one looks at him in any negative way and he's not ashamed about it. Or, or will he be perfected with a body that with, without that condition I, I believe that he wouldn't have it right. not for the sense though that I think that maybe he would be humble enough to say he would accept it but I just think that it would God would not necessarily make him that picture perfect model out of a magazine but just to show them that you know he doesn't have to live with that because I believe that since it's a disease I believe that just for that reason it won't be there well, that goes along with also what you said, Austin, which is th his outer appearance wasn't who he was. This wasn't what he, who he was as a human being. Um, and his outward appearance was – There's, he, I, I could say with confidence he won't be that way. His outward appearance was the effects of the fall. It, 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 was, it was not how human beings are supposed to look. And that wasn't anything he did wrong. It was just simply something that happened to happen to him as a result of a fallen state of man. And this is how uh, how his deformity came about. You know, it was part of the imperfect man. And who, but the person who he was, I think the real beauty of that individual, like you said, inside is who you're going to see as a person in heaven. And that's going to be a much different looking person from what he looked like on earth. Yeah. Amen. If I might say real fast, it also reminds me that it shows uh, God's glory. Because I remember that the blind man and Jesus, uh, they asked him, Who, why is this man like this? Is his mom sin or his father sin? And he said, she said, no, no, it's just to show, it's uh, to manifest God's glory. So I think that sometimes when we take things in perspective, we see that in others. We're thankful for what we have, hopefully. There's others that <clears throat> don't see to that, but hopefully we see it as we're grateful for what we have. And also just to show that uh, it's not necessarily like you said they didn't do anything to earn it, but it's just it's it just happened because of the fall, and it's just also to give God's complete glory in understanding that there is a perfection, and we don't have that right now. Yeah, I'm wondering. Um, well, in the case of the Elephant Man, I know that he was also if, if they portrayed it correctly in the movie, he, he was in a lot of pain too. He suffered a lot, but it. it, it 
how many people can you think of who are great inspirations but have no arms or legs? Or one that comes to mind is this uh, Christian uh, writer, Johnny Erickson Tata. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. Well, when she was a young girl, she uh, got in an accident uh, on a horse or swimming or something and broke her neck. And from the neck down, she's paralyzed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then there's another guy I've seen on YouTube videos where he has no arms and no legs and he just kind of hops around or something and he goes to churches and gives sermons and he, he's just full of joy. Uh, these are the most inspirational people, far more inspirational than, than any of us could ever be uh, because they are joyful even in that state. Oh, absolutely, so, and those people put things in perspective for us too. You know, We complain about things we go through. But when you see a person, uh, I, I, it's so funny you said that. There was another uh, speaker, a man I saw a long time. He, he was on a television program, and he was speaking at a church congregation. He had cerebral palsy. I can't remember what his name was, but I was so touched by his speaking because you know it, you could see it's very frustrating for him because he was his body would contort, and, and he couldn't control that. And then we had moments where it was worse, and he couldn't – you know. and you feel for this person, but he had – he saw absolutely no – um, uh, negative in that. He didn't take that at all. His spirit was so filled with the love of God that to him, all he could do is praise God, even in this state that we would look at and go, wow, that would just frustrate the heck out of me. There's, how, how could that not just frustrate him where he can't, he can't speak, he can't, he can't do that without moving a certain way? And to him, all, all he's doing is up there giving God glory, and I just it could it brought tears to my eyes. I just couldn't get over it. And it puts things in perspective for us in those moments where we complain because things could be a lot worse yeah. for us. <laughs> I, I have actually heard some people that uh, uh, fall into that category uh, that, that actually say that if they had a choice, they would not be born as a normal person with all their limbs, they, because because uh, they just be like everybody else, but because they're where they, they are, they're unique, and it gives them a, a great opportunity for this platform to inspire people. Uh, the, that That's a level of humility that I just, I, I could hope one day I could attain that level of humility, because I, I don't have it. And, and it's, it's just, for a person to look at something like that, and to look at their, you know, just going forward and to have such a positive attitude like that, I'm just utterly impressed. I just can't. I can't take it. It's just okay. Um, uh, the next question Randy asks is: Will our resurrection bodies have five senses? God designed us with five senses. They're part of what makes us human. Our resurrection bodies will surely have these senses. I expect they will increase in their power. And sensitivity. We'll stand on the new earth and see it, feel it, smell it, taste its fruits, and hear its sounds. Not figuratively, literally. We know this because we're promised resurrection bodies like Christ. He saw and heard and felt, and as he cooked and ate fish, he presumably smelled and tasted it. We will too. Um, well, obviously the best um, – he, he cited the best ex example, I mean the best um, reason to assume that we'll have these senses is that uh, we're told that uh, we will have bodies like Jesus' resurrected body. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and using that as a foundation, uh, we can come to all kinds of conclusions as we go along in this study if we just assume that we're going to be – like he was when he was resurrected. I th to me, to me, there's no question that we'll have five senses. The question to me is, um, how will our senses be without without the curse? How how heightened will those senses be? Will we have other senses that we're not even aware of that we would normally have? But if it wasn't for the curse, we don't have now. So there's no question to me whether we'll have the five senses. The question, my sense is, the question to me is, will we have six senses or seven? <laughs> will we have, will we have more senses than we have? Yeah, exactly. That was my presumption. Yeah. Is that if no doubt we'll have the five? I think though, if if we only do have five, it'd be like a super. Uh, Superman, supernatural yeah. ability, uh, like the right, a super enhancement of those yeah. five. You, you would, I don't know. Like, 
Could you even like imagine another sense? How, what would you come up with? If you had to pick up, uh, what's going to be the, another sense that we have? What would it be? I can't even imagine. My brain can't even comprehend thinking of what a new sense would be. <laughs> I, I, yeah, that's tough. <laughs> Will we be able to fly? I don't know. I'm. I don't know. Because don't the angels they hover? I mean the. Uh, the <sighs> It's, it's implied that the angels, you know, moved up and down when when uh, Ezekiel saw his vision. They flew up and down, and they, I mean, uh, people tend to say, "Well, angels have wings," and there are things that in the Bible that kind of allude to both. Maybe they don't. Maybe they do. That's that's actually a debate. There are people yeah. who debate that issue. I think um, we have to not use the in, in angel uh, comparison though, because we're going to be yeah. people. We're not going to be angels. Right. We're going to be, in fact, in fact, we're made lower than the angels now. But we'll be somewhat above the angels in in our state after we're going to be made. Yeah. Um, so, it's hard to say. It's like picturing another sense. I don't know. I I don't know. Yeah, and flying would not be another sense. It would be some kind of a power or ability, but it's not mm -hmm. a sense. Uh, but I can't even imagine a new sense. I don't know if it's even possible to imagine something like that. I mean, the, the only thing I could come close to thinking about is being able to see things in the realms that are happening around us that we currently can't see. Seeing that realm, um, like that God, realm. yeah, the spiritual realm that God keeps us from seeing, um, and I believe He does that for very good reason. Yeah. Every time, well, is, that about, a new, is that a new sense or just enhanced ability to see things? And, and again, you know, is that just an, an enhanced sight? I, I don't know. It's it's hard to say what a new sense might be. Or well, may not. well, what about the sense, the sense of uh, smaced? Of what? <laughs> smaced. <laughs> that sounds know. made up. Come on. <laughs> well, that's the combination of smelling and tasting. Smaced. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the whole idea. I mean, how can you even dream up a sense? I don't think that's possible. I don't know. In, in, a, way we, in a way, we do smaste because people say we smaste and you know, we smell. That's why we taste things. Most of our taste is smell. So uh, it's actually like, I don't know. It's hey, All things are possible, Brother Luke. All things are possible with God. Yeah. Or maybe we'll be able to, we'll have feeing, feeing. That's a combination of feeling and seeing. Feeling and seeing, feeing. <laughs> That'd be really weird. <laughs> All right, let's go on. That's uh, it's just a whole weird. It's kind of like boggles in my mind to even try to think of what a new sense would be. Yeah. Heaven's delights will stretch our glorified senses to their limits. How will things look, and how far away uh, will we be able to see them? Will our eyes be able to function alternately as telescopes and microscopes? Will our ears? serve as uh, sound gathering discs? Will our sense of smell be far more acute, able to identify a favorite flower or person miles away uh, so we can follow the scent to the source? Here's one. Will, we, will our eyes be able to see new colors? We currently can't see ultraviolet and uh, infrared but we know they're real. Doesn't it seem likely that our resurrected eyes will see them? What did Adam and Eve see that we can't? Although we don't know the answers to these questions, it seems reasonable to suggest all of our resurrected senses will function at levels we've never known. David prayed, quote, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made, unquote. How much more will we praise God for the wonders of our resurrection bodies? It's I find it a lot of fun to think about this, even though we have no clue. But it just seems that uh, if the if, if we take the word fall, the fall to mean that we are fallen and diminished, mm -hmm. our abilities are diminished, and then we are uh, uh, resurrected. And, and uh, made perfect, then uh, then uh, our abilities should be what he originally had planned for us. Our abilities should be full, complete, and restored. So uh, uh, I, I think it's it's all logical to 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 assume all this. Uh, as we'll see in the following chapter, Scripture speaks repeatedly about eating in heaven. What will our resurrected taste buds be able to do? 
The best food here on earth is tainted by the curse. Our taste buds are still defective. Think of the best meal you've ever eaten, the best dessert you've ever tasted. Good as they were, they were just a hint of what's to come, a good enough hint to make us long for heaven. Hey, Brother Mitch, hi. Hello. Oh, you came just in time. We're trying to come up with a new sense uh, in addition to the five senses that we may have with our res resurrected glorified bodies. Can you mm -hmm. think of another sense? Another sense. Yeah. Uh, another sense for our for our glorified body. Yeah. You know, we got smell, taste, sight, feel, and what's the other Spider hearing? senses. Huh? Spider senses. <laughs> Should have spider senses. That's the kind of senses I, you know, all that you, this week. <laughs> See, I should I should have known that Mitch was going to come up with one. We're sitting there thinking, and we couldn't think of anything. And here, Mitch, like, spider sense. Our spider sense will be tingling. <laughs> <laughs> I should have known he was going to do that. Yeah. And, and you know, he didn't even miss a beat. He pulled it right out too. It was like he just yeah. pulled it right out. It was like that was great. Well, we're we're talking, we're speculating about you know what our glorified bodies are going to be like here. Randy Alcorn's asking a lot of questions and giving a lot of things to think about here. And one mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, should we assume that we'll have not only our five senses but possibly new senses? And will our senses be enhanced and greater? Will our vision be greater? And so on. Uh, and we were saying that it's logical to, to think that's maybe the case, but we don't know any scripture that, that actually declares it. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh. Okay. Well, I'm glad you could join us, Mitch. Yeah, I'm just trying to set this up. I'm actually going to be doing homework while I'm uh, working with you. So, Are you a multitasker? <laughs> he's he's by, by task task heel. Yeah, I'm, I'm multitasking over here. By, by multi, whatever it is, I'm, I'm doing it. Okay. Uh, uh, let me see. So our taste buds will be enhanced. Uh, I mean, if you like food now, if you know Eric, you love to cook. You all love all these different foods. We all love really delicious food. But how will, how will we even be able to handle it? I mean, when I eat something really delicious, sometimes I want to, I scream. I'm just get so excited about it. I get like, you know, I'm giddy. I actually tell this, uh, uh, if I've gone to a, a restaurant and the waitress asks me, how was the food? And if I really like it, I say, it's so good. I feel, I want, I want to scream. <laughs> I, I want ice cream too. Like I the ice cream. Sometimes the waitress will say to me, "Go ahead, stand up and scream. It's okay." <laughs> but my <laughs> wife, my wife holds me down. <laughs> I, you know, it's. I, I think in reality, I think we come back to. I, reality of it is, I, I think God gave us all the senses that we needed to function in a physical realm that He created to enjoy all the aspects of it. Um, colors. Uh, the tastes, the smells, the, to the touches, whether whether that refers to something you're touching or the human touch or or any of that. I think we got all of those. I think really it, it boils back down to what you said. It's um it's what will these sense these senses be like once we truly have them, and are because we don't really have the senses. We have limited versions of them because of the fall. So like you like you're just saying, you know, will food be you know, so good that we just couldn't take it. <laughs> it's that it's all we would ever want in these bodies because it would be so good. We just had to have it constantly. You know, um, that's an interesting question. I I think um, I, and and and. And colors are the same way, you know. It's it's like the more they come out with better technology and the more vivid colors and how clear you see things with a television with crystal clarity you see them with, um, you know, fish in the ocean and and you know, the blues of the ocean, the blues of the sky, you know, the the reds of the sunset and, the, and these these really intense high definition. And we see these things in high definition and we go. We go, wow, that's that's just as good as it gets. But it's uh, not as good as it gets. It's not as good as it gets. It's wow. it's still limited, you know? And and that right there goes right back to what you just said. It's kinda I mean, there's no way to describe it. How do you describe something that you've never truly experienced? You don't you don't know what it's gonna feel like. You yeah. we go back to that word you used before, being in heaven. It's gonna be ecstasy. It's gonna be 
it's going to be just joy beyond comprehension. Yeah. Yeah. I want the spider senses. The spider so, sense? Yeah, I, I want I want to like like swing from building to building. <laughs> I mean, that, that, you know. See, now wait a second. You're confusing a sense with an ability. Well, the, both. The spider spider is not a sense, it's spider ability. You want to be able to, you know, use your spider man uh, climbing ability. Oh yeah, but I, I still want those. The, I want that tingling feeling whenever like there's, there's food around or something like this. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like ah, there's a good restaurant over here. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I know we're talking about taste, but I'm, and you mentioned seeing. You know, if you if you think back to the days, uh, Austin doesn't even know this time. He's so young, but I remember when we had black and white TV, <laughs> and then all of a sudden you get color TV. And now you beyond color TV, you have HD, and, and uh, it's just uh, you don't know what you're missing until you get the next thing. And it's the same kind of thing with these senses and enhanced senses. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, to be st restored to the sensory abilities of Adam and Eve would be thrilling enough, but it seems likely our resurrected bodies will surpass theirs. What God remakes, he only improves. God could add new senses to our old ones. Oh, well, see, here he's talking about your idea, Eric. New okay. senses. What do I mean? I don't know how could I, how could I explain a sense I've never experienced yet. If we'd never known sight, how could we sense what we were missing? If you'd never been able to smell uh, lilacs or taste blueberry pie or hear Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, how would you grasp what it means to smell or taste or hear such things? Well, uh, it's, it's really a good point, uh, and, but I'm just excited about the possibility of getting some additional senses. Well, you know, you know, the, and that goes back to something you mentioned earlier too, which is when we th we think of people who have certain handicaps, um, people who don't have their sight, or people who don't have their hearing. What sight for the first time for them is going to be like? Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, to I, I couldn't. It'd be pretty scary to me to imagine, you know, living in a world of darkness where you you can't see what's right in front of you. You just can't see it. For that person to suddenly, well, you, you know, it, it describes in the Bible when the man receives his sight, you know, he leaps for joy and he's telling everybody, you know, and he wants to tell because he couldn't get over. He's seeing for the first time. I can't imagine what, what those colors looked like for the first time, what light looked like for the first time with people. You know, what did he think people actually looked like? What did he, what did he think that um, water looked like? What did, you know, it's, it's simply something he can't even imagine because he's never seen it. Yeah. So it, it's kind of that kind of thing. It's it's that kind of aspect. Yeah. Wasn't at first? Didn't he see trees? What? Jesus fixed his eyes and he said, "What do you see?" And he sees, and didn't he say, "I see a bunch of trees?" And then Jesus is like, "Oops, let me fix it again." And then he, then he saw everybody. <laughs> <laughs> he did like my television. He hit him in the side of the head again. So wait a second, hold on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> he, he said he saw men walking around, but they looked like trees. In other words, right. he wasn't clear. It wasn't perfect vision yet. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. He just need to give him some of that Holy Spirit clarity. It was kind of it was his. He was kind of it was coming into focus. You know, things were coming into focus for him for the first time. Yeah, yeah. that's an interesting thing. That uh, in that in that case, uh, two things that are intriguing about that to me. One is that uh, he didn't instantly see clearly. It, it took like two tries by Jesus in a way to two things he did. And then also the other thing was the fact that. Jesus didn't just say, hey, you can see, or open your eyes, you can see, or something. He spit in the dirt, made some mud, and put the mud on his eyes. Why would he Why would he do that? I mean, you, he, you think he really needed to put mud in the guy's eyes? I think it was symbolic. Yeah, because aren't we made out of the, of the dust? Well, well, we're, yes, our bodies are made out of the dust. We'll, we come from the dust of the earth, and we'll return to the dust of the earth. But uh, when you say symbolic, uh, Mitch, what do you mean? Oh, he's gone. Um, Eric, any uh, any idea on why Jesus 
didn't just make the guy see, but he went through the the the, the step of, of spitting and making mud and putting it on his eyes. Um, I I had a theory about that in the past. My theory was actually it went along the lines a little bit of what Austin was kind of saying. You know, it was maybe that he literally was manipulating the molecules and the elements of the earth to actually fill in the gaps of molecular problems he was having with his cells. You know, that whatever was wrong with his eyes, he actually what he was doing was actually putting, you know. Putting the pieces essentially back together. He was basically doing that physically. Um, okay, I'll tell you. I mean, I'm guessing, of course. I'm. It's a guess, you know. But here's my theory on it. Uh, I've always felt that uh, Jesus, Jesus could have just um, not said a word, not even just, but just thought. Give him a sight, and he would have got a sight. He could have just said, "You can see now." And then, but by doing that, all the people who are observing. I had nothing, and they had to come to a certain conclusion. Jesus gave him a sight because he did this and did that, and the guy got a sight. So it was a, it was an actual something for people to observe and watch him do, so that they know he got a sight because of what I did. Right. He's always big on faith. He always likes to put it out there to where. In other words, he did it. He did it for the witnesses, for people who are watching, so that they could understand that he was responsible for the man getting a sight. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's just my theory. I think it just felt like sticking mud in the guy's eyes. <laughs> uh, hey, come over here. I want to fix your sight. Isn't there a saying? Uh, here's the mud, mud in your eye. There's mud in your eye. There you go. Hey, yeah, come over here. I'll stick some mud in your eye. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder where that saying came from. What that means? I love to track the the origins of of you know cliches of sayings like that. Mud in your eye. No, probably came. You could from Google it and verse. find out the origin of it. What's that? Probably came from that verse. Yeah, maybe it is. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, on the new earth, I think we'll continually be discovering, to our delight, what we never knew existed. What we've been missing all our lives. No joy is greater than the joy of discovery. The God who always surpasses our expectations will forever give us more of himself and his creation to discover. I totally agree with that premise. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. the, No joy is greater than the joy of discovery. The, the mm -hmm. idea that we can go on and learning, every day learn something, uh, and it never ends. It goes on eternity. Forever and ever, and the first days, like first ten thousand day years, as the song goes. Uh, after ten thousand years, yeah, I'm no closer to the end. You know, it's it's just it never ends. The amount of learning that you you have, and I know, uh, particularly studying scriptures more than anything else. Uh, over the years, I might read a verse, you know, five times, ten times, twenty times, thirty times, and you know. It, Eight ten years later, I read the verse, and wow, I see it. It I never saw. Why didn't I see it yep. <laughs> the first hundred times I read it? But now I got a revelation, and every time I do that, it is such a happy experience to d this discovery of a new a truth. It makes me new to, uh, do a new video because I watch. <laughs> I do. This is what I do. I read it. And I, I'm doing a video, and I go, "Wait a minute! I just saw something else. Let me do another yeah. video on that one." Yeah. Because it, it just it, it, it keeps clarifying and clarifying. And, and by the way, thank you because I, I was in this terrible depression and I really needed to talk about heaven today. So I feel a lot better today. Hey, yeah. Anytime. Good, good. 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 You, were, you were suffering from James depression. <laughs> That's exactly what I was suffering from. <laughs> I'll tell you what, those verses you did about what was it? Uh, uh, mourn and be sorrowful and just be miserable. Just be miserable. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, all three scriptures is telling us to be joyful and you know hope and joy. And James says, "Be miserable." Be <laughs> What's the matter with you reading that verse today? Be miserable. What's the wrong? Oh, yeah, right. Happy. It's the matter with you people. I dare you be happy, be right? Okay. So his next question is: Will our new bodies have new abilities? When it comes to doing what God wants and what we want, sometimes our bodies fail us. The disciples intended to pray in Gethsemane, but fell asleep. Jesus said to them, The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Our resurrection bodies, however, will never fail us. 
they'll work in perfect concert with our resurrected minds. We should anticipate an unprecedented harmony of mind and body. Sometimes we get hints of this. H.A. Williams says, quote, When I play a game well, I have for that limited period of time an experience of the body's resurrection. For there is no hint of a dualism between mind and body with either of them trying to oppress or bully the other. I bring to the game my total undivided self, unquote. I can relate to that in golf. It's a perfect example of playing golf, how your body and mind, if it has to be in sync, otherwise, if I get a negative thought in my head, my body can't perform at all. That would be wonderful to have my mind and body in harmony all the time. God. Uh, Christ's resurrection body had an ability to appear suddenly, apparently coming through a locked door to the apostles. Uh, Eric, could you look up John 20, 19? Sure. Uh, and then disappearing from the sight of the two disciples at Emmaus and also Luke, um, uh, Austin, can you get Luke 24, 31? Sure. Uh, when Christ left the earth, he defied gravity and ascended into the air, Acts 1-9. I'll look that up. I don't want to ask Mitch. I know he's already bytasking. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm actually in uh, account, the accounting Bible right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm doing that. Okay. All right, so let's read those. Uh, the first one. I have mine. Okay. Yeah, the, Go ahead. Go ahead, Austin. Okay, Luke twenty four thirty one. It states, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. Yeah. Now he did. It's not like saying he walked away and gradually faded away into the distance. You know, uh, you know, he vanished, and we get the idea that it, this is just suddenly just disappeared. He's no longer there. Yeah, I mean, the, the term's not used anywhere else in Scripture for somebody just walking away. It, it doesn't use the term vanished out of their sight, so it's a, it's being used expressly for that reason. Yeah. Um, and John chapter 20, verse 19 says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Okay, so he appeared there. He, he didn't... Like Peter, when Peter was knocking on the door and, and, and to get inside, and they said, who is it? And he says, it's Peter, and they opened the door and let him know. This doesn't explain that Jesus uh, knocked on the door or came through the door. He just appeared there. So we have two examples, and then uh, Acts 1.9, let me see, it says, uh, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So that's Jesus ascending uh, from the earth. Physically, his body ascended, raised up, like levitated up off the earth and went off. off. Um, so his point of this is that um, this, the scripture says that our bodies will be like Jesus. His is, is an example of what our resurrected bodies will be like. Can we? Is it safe to assume then that we should also have these same abilities that he demonstrated that were supernatural abilities uh, or, or, or are those abilities unique just to him or are they are they do they go along with this resurrected body well I, I don't think we should assume anything I think we I think I think we have reasons in scripture to believe that it could be the case we could have similar abilities but then again um, that this could be something that's just distinctly you know Christ's capabilities, maybe not ours, but I mean, it, it could be something we could do. Not necessarily will be something we could do. Yeah. Uh, I've said this many times over the years that I uh, I believe that, that uh, we, we probably will have these abilities, and I'm excited about the idea of just being able to materialize. Instead of like, like um, uh, Eric's in uh, uh, Maryland, right? Mm-hmm. Virginia? Which one is it? Maryland. Oh, maybe we don't want the world to know exactly where you are. Let's give them a if, false... I, I, I don't want to know where I am. I'd rather be somewhere else, believe me. <laughs> okay. Well, let me take uh, let me take uh, Mitch instead, because he, everybody knows he's in San Diego now. Right. I don't want to actually transport out of here. I like it here. 
Yeah, but I, what if what if right now we could all just go and be with Mitch and help him with his accounting studies right now and just materialize and appear right in his room right now? Wouldn't that be great? Instead of having to get in the car and drive there or fly it there, might, or it might be great for us because it, it might be great for us, but not for Mitch. Mitch is kind of like, I don't want you guys just showing up at my house, popping in whenever you want to. I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think he'd want that. No, hey, you know bring what? beer and pizza or something. You know, bring hey. something. You know, bring oh, something. oh, as long as we bring something, we're good there, right? Yeah, so beer and pizza. Bring some food, some beer and pizza. Okay, that's yeah, good. we're all right. Okay, so so Mitch is the kind of guy that we we're, we can just pop in on him anytime, <laughs> but but. Uh, I think you make actually a really good point, Eric. Well, if we do have the bill or ability just to appear somewhere, what if someone doesn't want us to appear in right there, right then? You know, you, we should be able to block people. You know, block. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's one of those senses. That's another ability. See, blocking. Uh, somebody people. wants to. Like, oh, we gotta block. I'm people. gonna block you. And here's another. Here's another yeah. thing that. Uh, uh, actually pertains to what we were discussing earlier as, as what our, our physical appearance will be. Uh, Jesus. Uh, there's a couple of examples of Jesus, people not recognize him, and then he seemed to change his appearance, and they say, oh, I see, that's Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, on the road to Emmaus is one, and then also with uh, Mary at the tomb. At first, they can't, they don't know it's Jesus, and then they see that it is Jesus. And I I think that this is like in sci-fi, what they call shape-shifting, where you can just change how you look, change, change your physical uh, construct structure. And so uh, I... I Excited about the uh, possibly having the ability to be a shapeshifter and being able to like beam me up, beam me, beam myself all over the place. Well, don't uh, demons have that ability? Well, therefore, not just demons, but angels have that ability to shapeshift. Yes, uh, it seems like angels do. They they uh, are times where they take uh, a physical appearance as a man, mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, uh, they they seem to be able to appear and disappear. Mm -hmm. So yeah, with these these are abilities that, that we think angels have, and apparently we'll have those angels. We'll have those abilities too. That would leave me uh, out. And yet and yet and yet we're not going to be angels. You know we don't want to give the people the idea that we just be, die and become an angel. You know that's like. Yeah, but you, but Austin kind of bridged the gap though. He kind of said you know if angels had these kind of properties and Jesus had these kind of properties, it's reasonable to consider the fact that we may have those properties being somewhere in between that. So it's like, it's, yeah. I, think, I think it's a reasonable possibility. Yeah, and I think, uh, Austin, when you bring up angels, uh, kind of like reinforces this, the case uh, favoring or the, us receiving that ability. Uh, so why wouldn't we? If angels can do it, why wouldn't we be able to uh, do it? If Jesus did it. The angels can do it. Why would we, we be the only ones that can't change our appearance or, or change our location at will? Hey Amen. Well, yeah. I have to ask this, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting kind of confused with this. What is the main difference now, once we'll be in the resurrected bodies, between, <laughs> between us and angels? Uh, a well, angels are not are not physical beings uh, unless they take on that form and it's, it's, it's for a temporary uh, purpose, uh, uh, for a, a mission. Uh, the word angel is messenger, means messenger, and God's if he sends them to perform a task on a mission, uh, then they take on the physical form in order to accomplish it, and then they no longer have it. They do not uh, have a body as man does. Uh, we, man is triune. We are not complete without a body. We're body, soul, and spirit. That's our, our normal uh, state of existence. Will we be able to coexist with them, though? I, of course. Of course. I think, well, I, think so. yeah. I, think, I think in eternity some of my best friends will be angels. Okay. <laughs> I hope so. I I they're, very, very, they're very powerful. Like one angel could kill 10,000 people no. in the Bible. You know? I was going to say, it's, it's nice to know that they have our back. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who will be fighting, but, you know, it would be nice to have them around. I, yeah. sure. I play pool with them, you know. <laughs> Shoot some hoops. Yeah, but that's, that's the like, thing is I want them to have some limitations because they'll cheat. <laughs> <laughs> now nah, cheating's wrong. And see, that's bad. So you can't. Do <laughs> oh, but they're, they're using their abilities. You know, I have to have the same abilities. I think I want more limitations. I really do. I think I think maybe I should be limited to a certain amount of time, and then I should say to myself, you know what? I, I really like to like have like 
total abilities on the weekend. But during the week, it's just to be a normal person. <laughs> on the weekends, you think we're going to have weekends? <laughs> yeah, well, you've got this. You have the, the the Sabbath, and you've got Sunday. Yeah, you know, we have those days. You know, on those days, I want to be able to fly, go where I have to go, and you know, and on other days, I want to be like limited. You know, and then Jesus comes along and comes through a wall. I can just imagine it because Jesus would like pop through the wall and go, "Hey!" And I'm like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> I said, "All right, all right, cool." You know, but. You know, I, I just think it's going to be wild in heaven. I don't know what our limitations are going to be and our abilities are going to be, but I really think that it's going to be orchestrated in a way that it's going to be made for us to be able to enjoy. Absolutely. Amen. I, I think that's what's, what, what, what it'll be like. I think that's one thing that we're doing is we're trying to limit what heaven's going to be. I think that it's something unfa unfathomable. Like, mm -hmm. of course, we won't be clone to God, but I'm just saying, well, I don't think how we see is we'll put a limit on us. I don't think that would be necessarily the case. I think that five days a week we need to be miserable in heaven. And then... <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you can have your five days of misery. I, I've had enough misery here. Yeah, um, exactly. But... <laughs> you know, I'm just talking about heaven for some people. Oh, yeah, misery. I got you. I got you. I missed it. I'm sorry. I'm waiting over my head. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's I, okay. I, I, I'm I totally missed today. it. I totally missed it. <laughs> All right, um, back to Randy Elkhorn here. He says, it's possible that the risen Christ, who is man, yet God, has certain physical abilities we won't have. Appearing and disappearing could be a limited expression of his omnipresence, and his ascension might be something our bodies couldn't imitate. On, on the one hand, uh, because we're told in multiple passages that our resurrection bodies will be like Christ, it may be possible at times to transcend the present laws of physics and, and or travel in some way uh, we're not now capable of. On the other hand, it's our God-given human nature to be embodied creatures existing in space and time, so it's likely that the same laws of physics that governed Adam and Eve will govern us. We can't be sure, but either way, it will be wonderful. Amen. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I like the way he presented to both sides of that uh, position there. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just, it, it intrigues me because I picture myself in heaven and working with stucco. I don't know why, but just building with stones and making buildings with stucco, white stucco. And just like making these beautiful buildings, gardens, whatever it is. And then I'm just sitting there having my big ham sandwich, which is on kosher. And it's pretty good work. Hey, you know, you could do, uh, look at this corner over here. Let me show you something. You know, you sit down with Jesus and he shows me some, like, uh, some of his mason abilities. Because, you know, carpenter didn't mean like carpenter. It meant like builder, you know, because I could sit down and like relate with Jesus that way. I, I could just see myself it just being cool. Him coming over, relaxing, chilling, doing well, stuff with my hands. I, I think uh, we might be popping in on those some of those occasions too. <laughs> just like he comes I think he just comes around and visits us, you know, and we're just kind of busy doing our thing, maxing, relaxing. It it'd be nothing like the earth. And I guess that's what I'm getting at. And on the earth there is no rest. There's rest in Christ, yes there is, but on the earth, everything is always, something is happening, there's always something out there that's going to take our peace away. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and relaxing in Christ is really difficult because there's all sorts of foxes coming up and destroying our peace constantly all the time. Whereas yeah. in heaven, I really think that it's going to be like, it's just going to be cool. There's not going to be any, any you know, um, frustrations where you've got to be aggravated half the time. You know, Mitch, that, that's funny that you said that because going back to the verse that he used a little while back, you know, that's kind of a good description of how we are in our salvation where it says the spirit is willing but the body is weak. It's the same thing with us in our salvation. Spiritually, we're perfected in Christ, you know, but with our bodies being fallen, we're weak. And with that is exactly what Mitch says. It comes along with all that. It, you know, the times we fall, the times we still sin, the times we still don't do the things we want to do, and the fact that we can't really have true rest 
in this state that we're in because there's always something, you know, uh, stressing us or nagging at us or pulling at us. There's always these negative things. We've never known a life without that. We, you know, we've lived and grown up in this world that's that's always had that. Amen. Yeah. And imagine that all being lifted. I mean, that's I, incredible. I, I mean, I see, I see, like in this instance, Jesus, you know, Jesus doesn't do anything just to show off. He always does something for a purpose. I mean, and Jesus coming back to the disciples to show him these things that his resurrected body could do, it seems to me that was his whole point. His whole point in doing that was to show them, look, this is what you have to look forward to in your resurrection. When you're resurrected, these are some of the things that you're going to have to look forward to. I think that was sort of his whole point. He doesn't, he doesn't do things to just show off. It's not Jesus' way. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I do. If I was Jesus, I would show off. <laughs> see, but that, and me too. See, that's why I'm not him. See, that's, that's why I'm not him because I'd, I'd do it and show off. He shows off in his way. I think I think he's spectacular. I think that he does show off, but it, but for the glory of God, for the glory of God. Yes. Know. <laughs> okay. Um, we don't know the glorious plans God has for our bodies. We may have a whale's ability to dive or an eagle's ability to fly. Maybe we'll run like a cheetah or climb a mountain like a goat. And who knows what cheetahs and goats may be able to do then. <laughs> Still, we shouldn't assume too much about flying and dematerializing in, uh, in light of the fact that the eternal city will have streets and gates implying normal ground traffic. Perhaps as our present inability to fly led to the invention of airplanes, our limitations as finite beings, even in our resurrection, will inspire us to exercise dominion over our environment by creating and perfecting new transportation modes. Perhaps some of what's been long dreamed of in science fiction awaits us in the new universe. Well, in that case, that's definitely, if that's going to be the case, then that's definitely something that I have to look forward to because my dream is, and I worked I worked to, toward it for a period of time, but I didn't get the chance to finish it, was I wanted to be a pilot. And I worked on my... Uh, pilot's license. I got 21 hours logged in, and unfortunately, I had to stop. But for me, there's nothing like that feeling. I love flying. I love. I. I just. I love everything about aviation. Um, everything about it. And so for me, that would definitely be something God is going to have me involved in. Then in heaven is something to do with flying because I just. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I, I always wanted to be a blimp pilot. A blimp pilot. <laughs> Oh, I, I can't think of, I don't want to, I mean, you give me a fast aircraft, that's fine. You know, some, one of those Harriers, you know, Jeez. But, a, but a blimp, a blimp is slow, it floats like a like like you're in the clouds. It, it, it's, it, it's more mellow, it's more relaxed. Oh, yeah, you have, a, you have a more stop and smell the roses kind of attitude. Well, you're kind of uh, like, I really want to appreciate taking my time over here while I'm blowing two times past in the speed of sound, you know, two times the speed of sound. You want to be enjoying what's been yeah. underneath. I want to well, be in the moment. I don't well, want to sit here and fly. And you know what? I think that that's a great idea for people. I think that's the reason why they should bring back uh, a lot of blimp travel. Not over the, the Atlantic. That's where they totally messed up. They should be doing it over the Pacific over here where the, you don't have any storms, Harvey. Because they had a major disasters, uh, you know, uh, the Hindenburg and several other disasters that stopped bl blimp travel. And uh, the use of hydrogen, of course, wasn't a good thing, along with uh, aluminum oxide. I think the two was pretty crazy, uh, uh, you know, combination, aluminum oxide, and then just drop, drop, the, drop the rope down, you know what I mean, the, the cable down, <laughs> right. as soon as it hit the ground, bam, boom. Yeah. You know? It worked okay as long as everything went all right, but, you know. <laughs> you know, go with helium, but that's, that, what is that, uh, four, times, uh, four times heavier than, than hydrogen. Hydrogen is the lightest gas there is. So, I, I, I don't know, but, but, but just, I would love to just get on a, on a blimp. The way that they had it in visions, where, where where they had the blimp tower, like the the I, the uh, um, Empire State Building, they had a spike on there to, to 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 dock blimps. That would be my main way of travel. I'm not in a hurry. I want to see the sights. Yeah. I want to blimp across the country. I, I could. I just love the idea of uh, blimp travel. I, I think it should come back. Well, I can see you both getting what you want. Eric will be flying super fast uh, jets uh, that are like 
make what we have today seem like you know uh, archaic uh, prehistoric uh, inventions and moving around really fast. And his brother Mitch will be on this bimp blimp, but Mitch can actually enjoy a beer while he's flying in the blimp. <laughs> And Mitch, he has to remain focused. He has to be completely alert, so no beers on his uh, super fast jet. Oh well, the, uh, well. The thing is, is that uh, you know, yeah, on the super fast jet, I could just see psh, I'd have a drinking problem because you know <laughs> it'd be all over my face. So, but yeah. and when Mitch is up, in his, Mitch is up in his blimp. I'll use my powers to materialize up over there and, and have a beer and pizza with him up in the blimp. Yeah, beer and pizza is fine. You know, I'd like to just like grab, jump onto a rocket and like, shoot straight up to the moon or Mars, you know, like that. But you know, I, I, at some point or another, I just want to float in space and chill out, and, you know, relax, you know. Yeah. Check out the sights up there. Okay. Now his next question is: Will our bodies shine? Some people have asked me if our resurrected bodies will shine. They cite two passages. Quote, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Unquote. That's Matthew chapter 13. And quote, those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to, to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That's Daniel chapter 12. Jesus didn't have a halo after his resurrection, and there's no reason to believe we will. Christ's body appeared so earthly and normal that the disciples on the road to Emmaus didn't notice he was the resurrected Lord. However, during Christ's transfiguration, his clothing became as bright as a flash of lightning. Moses and Elijah, who joined Christ on the mountain, appeared in glorious splendor. After Moses received the Ten Commandments from God on the mountain, Moses' face shone. It's tempting to think of these des descriptors as figures of speech. Yet in some cases, including Moses, it was clearly literal. I believe that as resurrected beings, we will bear the physical evidence of living in God's presence. If I might uh, touch in on this, what I've talked with a brother over is that we were talking about the substance of what our soul is made out of, and we were coming to the conclusion that I said it has to be a type of energy-based thing because it you know, lasts forever when it's restored to its perfect ability. So what I was thinking is that I, I was – he put out ideas, I put out ideas, and I said that the soul is made out of light, the energy of light, and I would – and then I – and then just relating to that, I would say that the resurrected body has that everlasting – Ability with you know through Christ, so I would I then said that since our soul is back to everlasting, it will shine like a light. And I even described salvation that way. I, I told him because he, he also asked where the sin nature came from, and I know a lot of there's a lot of different theories about it's in the DNA or it's in the flesh. And I came across I said it was in the blood because I used Leviticus 17:11 to say that life was in the blood and the opposite of life would be death and death is sin and everybody has the sin nature they're born with it so I said that once and it also says too in Leviticus 17:11 that the the blood guards the soul and if the I, I referenced to like a light bulb I told them that our soul is kind of like a light bulb when we're born and it's you know when you have a light bulb you don't twist it all the way into the socket so when you turn the switch it doesn't turn on I said that when we're saved, Jesus Christ comes in, he cleanses us with, with, with his righteous blood, and he basically turns that light bulb all the way into the, the outlet so when we flip the switch, it, it turns on. So I reverence salvation to that, but I'm almost convinced that uh, we will shine because I believe that our soul is literally made out of the energy of light. Huh. That's very, all very interesting. And uh, th there are uh, cases, as Randy pointed out, uh, 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 that it says that the saints that we will shine and that and, uh, Jesus shone at the transfiguration Moses shined when he came down from Mount Sinai uh, so uh, and, and I don't know where the uh, maybe in Roman Catholicism they got it from these verses here that we've discussed but they have a picture of of Jesus and all the saints and with halos on. Uh, so. um, I think that that came from the uh, 
uh, sun worship. Yeah. Some of that stuff uh, actually came from uh, paganization of right. Christianity through. That's Constantine. actually that's actually the sun, is what that is. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. think Mitch is correct on that. I think that that's uh, semi Romus, if I remember, was the was the pagan yeah. goddess that. Uh, Samaramis, uh, Nimrod was the was uh, who was with Nimrod, I believe. Uh -huh. um, but but we've we've already seen some examples that, that talk about how they shined and that the you talk about the future that these saints like us we will shine. So uh, who knows how that will be manifest, uh, uh, and if we'll always shine or if for certain times that will glow because we've been. Maybe we went into the New Jerusalem and we got close to the throne, just like when when uh, Moses was up Mount Sinai and he was close to God. He he came down and he had this glow on him that they everybody could see. The she, they call it the Shekinah. Yeah. The Shekinah. So maybe maybe at that time we'll shine. Maybe we're not going to be like shining all the time, but maybe just when we get uh, on those occasions when we're closer to the. Oh, shekinah. there's a verse about that 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 that, that our. That our glory, or the, 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 that never goes, that never, that unfading glory, and so I believe it's in the New Testament. But I don't know exactly whether we'll shine or we won't shine, as long as we don't have underarm odor. You know, we actually smell nice up there. It would be fine with me. But, 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 but as a matter, you know, glowing or, or, or whatever. I mean, in New Jersey, we had a nuclear plant down the street, and so we all glow if you're from. from <laughs> Mm -hmm. From 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 Forkett River, New Jersey, but 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 you know, by and large, glowing is not really, you know, uh, you know, I don't know if I'll glow or I won't glow, but I I do know that that in the the that the state that I'll be in, I really think that we'll be entertained. I really think that that that, that what Christ will do is he will he will show us a, a he will give us a show in life. He will actually show us through life, um, through life in heaven, a good time, constantly. I, I just I picture Christ as being the the guy you want to hang out with and party with all the time, the guy that always brings you the good time, I, and and I mean that sincerely. I really mean that 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 that, that he would like come around and said, hey, what's up? you know, uh, you know, everybody seems to think that somehow or another we're going to be like down on our face, and and Christ is going to be. You know, somehow or another, we're we're going to have to be in some sort of state of uh, of fear when Christ comes. But like John, I would rec recline with them, ha hang out with them. I really think that 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 he'll have. There'll be laughter. There'll be joking. There'll be times, and those times will never end. I really think that that's the essence of heaven: is 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 is, is rejoicing with your Savior and with your God and being able to. To like my children, like my children are grown now, and and my son came to visit me, and he, he was looking all dapper and everything like that, and we just had a great time together. We really did, and I really think that 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 that's what heaven. It'll be such a joy, but people just they get this idea in their head that somehow or another there's going to be this, you know, fall on your face, and I I I I don't reject the holiness of Christ. But I accept the, 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 the invitation to come and fellowship with him and hang out with him, just like Mary and Martha, mm -hmm. and more like Mary. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next question Randy asks, uh, will we be male or female? One book about heaven claims there will be no male and female human beings. We shall all be children of God, and sex will be no part of our nature. The same book says, men will no longer be men, nor will women be women. Similarly, another book says of those in heaven, they have reached that androgynous condition in which sex distinctions are transcended, or rather, in which the qualities of both sexes are blended together. It's like well, those dwarfs that have beards. You know, the women dwarfs have beards. You know, I'm wondering what it would be like if Freddie Mercury actually uh, <laughs> repented. You know, what would he be in heaven? You know. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. But I would I would say I would I, I would say that I, we, I want I I actually like my manhood. I would like to be a man in heaven. I don't know what angels were like if there were females and males in heaven. I don't. I, and um, there's another brother that we all know that thought that there would be all sorts of sex in heaven. But I really think that 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 it would be more like we are who we are. <clears throat> I don't think I want to have an operation against the unisex up there. I yeah. don't know what it's going to be like, but I just think that. Uh, and who knows what it actually will be like? But I really um, like the distinction. I like to be a man. That's yeah. part of me, you know. Yeah, well, I can't disagree with that either, brother. I'm <coughs> Uh, isn't it interesting that, that he cited, uh, quoted from two different authors that are stating, declaring, that we will not have any sexuality. Uh, it'll be androgynous. You will neither be male nor female. So this is, uh, this is actually uh, um, being uh, stated in some books on heaven. Uh, some people try to prove there will be no gender in heaven, citing Paul's statement that in Christ there is neither male nor female. That's Galatians 3.28. But Paul refers to something that's already true on earth, the equality of men and women in Christ. The issue isn't the obliteration of sexuality. You don't lose your gender at conversion. Yeah, I don't think that particular case, uh, the example in Paul, holds on at all because he's talking about that, uh, like there'll be no Jew or Gentile. There's no difference, male or female. Yeah, I, I think that was a bad example. I think the better examples where Jesus is asked about when a, a man's wife marries his brother and then his next brother, whose wife will she be? And Jesus essentially tells them she won't be anybody's wife in heaven. They'll be like the angels in heaven, uh, in which case they aren't married any longer. They're They're simply... You know, they're separate. They're individuals of themselves again in heaven. They're not. They're not quote unquote married. Um, but there's, there's nothing to insinuate that we will lose what makes us appear as men, and women will lose what makes them appear as women. I just believe we won't have any reason. We won't procreate. We won't have sexual intercourse with each other anymore. You can look like a man and retain your manly properties, like 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 Mitch said, and a woman retain her womanly properties and simply just don't procreate anymore. There's we don't have to procreate, you know. Um, there just won't be the need for it anymore. Um, and we won't feel the need for it. Uh-oh, what was that? I don't I was, know. It was pretty I was trying pretty to get a sad, a sad sound here, like, because uh, some people, really the idea of not being sexually active and married and having sex in heaven is, is a sad, sad thing. Let me think. I think it's this one. Here it is. <laughs> uh, I don't think it'll be an issue in heaven. I, I think no, I don't, would agree with I think that. it's one of those things we talked about where your desires won't be for those sorts of things anymore. You're, you Thank you. Yeah. What was now, that, Mitch? I, I Say that again. Thank God, because that causes so many problems anyway. <laughs> Yeah. It really does, it really women, does cause more problems than it does. Problems with women and jealousy and all of this. I don't need it. You I know? mean, that's how I see it. I mean, and when 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 the visions of vast numbers of quote unquote people are seen in the visions of heaven, it doesn't say vast numbers of men that they're all men all of a sudden, or that they're all women all of a sudden. It says people, insinuating they're all different. They're they, they're men. They're women. They're they're different. Um, different tribes. We talked about this earlier. Different tribes, nations, tongues. So, you know, if that were the case, why would we have different races? Wouldn't we all be the same race or all be the same? You know, I mean, I think we will be physically different and unique to what we were and who we were as people in the flesh. Yeah. I, um, I've often uh, referenced a, a theologian that I love and respect, even though I sometimes strongly disagree with him and it's Dr. Peter Ruckman. And I know in his commentary he's talking about this question. Uh, he takes the position that uh, when uh, J Jesus was asked about marriage, uh, and the, refer the point you were mentioning, Eric, and he said, uh, no, there will not be no marriage in heaven. It'll be um, like the angels. Mm. Uh, some people conclude that, well, Angels aren't having sex, and that's what he meant. There'll be no reason because people aren't having sex. But Dr. Ruckman says, 
No, uh, every angel uh, in Scripture is referred to in uh, a male as a male. That's there right. are no references of females, female angels. That's and, true. And so Ruckman takes makes the conclusion that everybody in heaven will be a male. That female somehow will be changed into male. So that, that's what he thinks. Uh, I don't. I don't think that's really a. Uh, so when I go to heaven, but, I'm with my wife for, for like 40 years, and all of a sudden she's a guy. <laughs> I, don't think, I, I, I think it's a I think it's a bit of a stretch for him to say that that's what Jesus meant. Yeah, he, he I don't I think he was referring to relationships. He was referring to the fact that remember you got to keep it in context. The whole context of the conversation was them talking about who was going to have her as a wife in heaven. His point was they're not going to be married anymore in heaven. They're individuals. They're not married anymore. So that was his point because the angels don't marry. They don't give it. That was his point of the comparison. To go beyond yeah. that and say, oh no, she's going to turn into a man. I think that's a bit of a stretch. Well, that, I, that, I, that was, was, you know, I was like, oh, I think huh, all right, now that I've been married, yeah, let's go down. Let's go down and play some pool together. You know, yeah. oh, you, know oh, hey, you shoot a couple rounds. Hey, what's, you know, let's shoot the. You know, uh, just hey, that's a nice right beard yeah. you got, girl. Yeah, right. I was gonna say. Happen. It wouldn't feel right if she's got a beard and a mustache. Oh, it just wouldn't feel right. I don't know. Something's wrong here. I know you've been trying to get rid of that mustache for years. Don't need to. <laughs> Well, we know that um, the example that Randy Alcorn gave with Galatians 3.28 is not applicable because he's not talking about uh, uh, you know, gender. He's talking about equality, that uh, Jews, Gentiles, yes. male, female, everybody is equally uh, saved. Right. Right. Um, uh, and so the other example we, we discussed is when Jesus answers the question about who will be the, the husband, of this woman in heaven, since she's had seven husbands, who will be her husband in heaven? He says, well, it's not like that in heaven. Uh, there's no marriage. It'll be, it'll be like the angels. So I think we are all in agreement that uh, uh, in that case, Jesus is talking about using the angel example because angels are not sexually active and they do not marry. So therefore, we can say, well, we won't be sexually active and we won't marry. Uh, but then that's going to break some people's heart because they love their spouses and they love their sex with their spouses and they think that that would be horrible to have that and no longer have that in, in, in heaven. Okay, uh, he also he writes, uh, was Jesus genderless after his resurrection? Of course not. No one mistook him for a woman or as androgynous. He's referred to with male pronouns We'll never be genderless because human bodies aren't genderless. The point of the resurrection is that we will have real human bodies essentially linked to our original ones. The gender is a God-created aspect of humanity. Okay, the next question he asks, unless you guys want to talk more about that, anything else on that? I don't see dudes going around in drag in heaven. <laughs> What's that? I don't, dudes going around in drag. In heaven, I don't think that's going to be that way. You know, I don't think no, we should even not, go there. It's not, it's not dudes going to drag. It's women dressing as dykes as dykes. A dude look like a lady. You know, or a lady look like a dude. Lady look like a dude. I don't think so. You know. No, I, of, doubt, I doubt it's going to be that way. No. I think so. You know, I got. I don't think that it's going to be that way. I mean, I've been in some of those bars. I used to be a bar hopper. I, I, I mean, I used to fix the, the soda machines, and I used to fix, fix the beer machines at the bar. So I was always popping over the bar. But I've been in plenty of bars like that. And I'll tell you, you know, I don't, I don't think I want to, you know, I don't know what it was that was asking me out for a date. I was like, look, I don't know. <laughs> That's way too much information, Mitch. Okay. We, got, we got two more questions we want to uh, try to get in here before we're done with this one today. And the next question is, will we wear clothes? Uh, because Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed, some argue that in heaven we won't need to wear clothes. But even in the intermediate heaven, uh, before the final resurrection, people are depicted as wearing clothes, uh, white robes that depict our righteousness in Christ. That's Revelation chapter 3. It appears we'll wear clothes, not because there will be shame or temptation, but perhaps because they will enhance our appearance and comfort. 
Wearing robes might strike us as foreign or formal, but to first century readers, anything but robes would have seemed strange. Why? Because robes were what they normally wore. Rather than conclude that we'll all wear robes, a better deduction is that we'll all dress normally, as we did on the old earth. Am I saying some people will wear jeans, shorts, t-shirts, polo shirts, or flip-flops? Well, wouldn't that those be just as normal for some 21st century people as robes and sandals were for first century people? Mm. Interesting idea. It is an interesting idea. I don't think... my. I guess the way I would see it is there we wouldn't need to wear clothes because of some kind of need to hide our nakedness. We wouldn't need to. Um, but maybe, again, we could be talking about something where these robes or these clothes that look like robes to them, um, maybe there's some kind of status behind these things that we're wearing. You know, maybe these things mean something. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> You know, I mean, it says in heaven we're going to be given a name that only God knows and, and things like that. So there may be some uniqueness to whatever garb we're clothed in. There may be something about it. Is there any reason why we cannot take this, uh, um, these examples of people in heaven wearing robes uh, as uh, the, uh, the robe just reflecting the righteousness of Christ covering us? And not, it's not literally a clothing or robe. I like clothes. I, I mean, guess, you know, it's not not just, it's just about being naked. I mean, I just like clothes. I think that they have they make a statement, and I think the statement that's being made here is 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 who we are in Christ, our style. Yeah. Even even now, he's wearing that hat because he's stylish. He's got his own style. This one doesn't match though. This is gray to brown. I had a brown hat, but it's well, too, uh, you know, too. Uh, north, it's too too cold. You know, it's are, got the. Are you going to have your favorite hats in heaven, Mitch? I I would imagine so. I can get myself somebody that you know a hatter. You know that. Will yeah, be. but can you? Will you be able to fit that hat over your halo? <laughs> I don't know that we'll actually have a halo. I might actually wear one, but I don't know if I want to. Uh, you know, look like the Statue of Liberty or. You know, something, you know, maybe yeah. we'll all wear a crown of thorns. I have no idea what we'll wear, but I, I really think that there'll be style up there. Yeah. Okay, well, really, there's two questions that Randy here is bringing up here. First is, will we have clothing at all? Will there be any need for it? Uh, is it possible that the uh, the white robes are, are not really robes, it's just the righteousness of Christ? Or or, or will are they actually wearing robes? And if we, in eternity, will we wear robes, even though robes are not common to our on uh, the 21st century way of dressing. I don't walk around, I go, don't go to the mall or the gas station wearing my robe, you know, I wear, you know, my pants, my shirt. <laughs> so, uh, I, I'm not sure which is the right way, whether we will be naked but covered with his righteousness and there's no reason to wear clothing, or if we'll wear the clothing that uh, we like to wear, whatever that is. Maybe I'll go back in time and say, hey, I think that robe was a great idea. I'm going back to that. That was they're comfortable. I like the idea of a toga party. You know. <laughs> and, toga and, party. and in fairness to some people, the idea the idea of an unlimited closet, a, a, a closet full of unlimited clothing is pretty pretty uh, that's a pretty happy time for some people. They really <laughs> like the idea of like being able to open a never ending closet of suits like the Matrix, you know, it's like you just kinda of open your closet and they all come shooting out and it's like you, your choice of suits. I mean that, that's a <laughs> I was thinking your choice of guns. <laughs> Matrix. I mean, we'll talk about that. You know. Yeah. Pull out this one or grab that oh, one. Man. You know. I want. You know, that's a good question. I got my own private question, Luke. Yeah. Now, see, I, I'm a big Wait, gun guy. This is private. I'm, you know, this is live. No, 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 no. I mean, I mean, I'm my own personal question. I should say, my own personal question. I mean, I'm a big gun guy. I like to shoot. You know, I love to shoot. I love shooting sports. All kinds of shooting sports. Yeah. Can I have my own? firing range up there and a big collection of firearms <laughs> that I can shoot at the range whenever I want to. Yeah. No, there's the gun lobby in heaven. Uh, is know, there a gun lobby in heaven? NRA up there and, you know, I don't know, man. Don't, are they all liberals up there? They won't let you have any guns? I, don't, I think they're going to be surprised the lack of liberal people that are going to be up there. <laughs> <laughs> You might not have those old archaic guns you have now. Maybe you'll just like shoot laser beams out of your eyes and do that instead. <laughs> but will that be uh, fun? Just... <laughs> well, I don't 
love that. Will that be fun? I want to do the Clint Eastwood, man. I, yeah, know. well, I want to shoot competitions with people and have fun. And you know, it, 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 that's that's a lot of fun I have with friends of mine and everything. It's it, it's a blast. We have a good time. Yeah, how accurate how accurate you're going to be with those enhanced senses and powers of yours? Oh man, oh, spider man. senses with a 44 you... Magnum. Oh, yeah, oh man, we'll do all right. You get incredible grouping with you that. Can even, you can even shoot Mitch as he shoots. <laughs> <laughs> There's no death. You can't hurt him or kill yeah. him. Either. No, it'd, be, it'd just I be all he's dodging sword. you as he's flying yeah. around buildings with this Spider-Man stuff. I'd have to just apologize to him. It's like, I'm sorry, Mitch, man. Did I hit you? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's no big deal. But it's so great. No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> right, cool. You know, but, you know, you might Matrix in there, Mitch bullets stop, Mitch. drop to the ground. Yeah, look at this. <laughs> I, I, you might think you're going to shoot Mitch, and he might just catch the bullet in his mouth, you know, with his. <laughs> I want to die and then resurrect myself. <laughs> so you can only do something like that down here once. <laughs> I should fall here's down the, and go. Oh, you think I'm dead? And stand back up again. Go ahead, shoot me again. Here's the final question of this uh, uh, study, uh, and that is: Will we all appear the same age? Will a child who dies at age six appear that age in heaven? Will the man who dies at 80 appear to be 80 as he walks the new earth? People have asked questions like these throughout the centuries. Alistair McGrath states, The issue caused the spilling of much theological ink, especially during the Middle Ages. By the late 13th century, the church's emerging consensus was this. As each person reaches their peak of perfection around the age of 30, they will be resurrected as they would have appeared at that time, even if they never lived to reach that age. Peter Lombard's discussion on the matter is typical of his age. A boy who dies immediately after being born will be resurrected in that form which he would have had if he had lived to the age of 30. The New Jerusalem will thus be populated by men and women uh, as they would appear at the age of 30, but with, with, with every blemish removed. I've heard other people talk about that too. Ruckman also says that uh, we'll, we will be 33 years old because that was the age of Jesus at the re his resurrection. Um, but you... Uh, if you were, let's say, you know, 80 years old or 90 years old, or and then you, you, would you want to come back with that age of a body, even if it was healthy, but but if that's how it appeared. Uh, uh, again, the, the best the best answer to this is that the verses that say that our bodies are going to be like Jesus's when he was resurrected. So, what do you think? This is a tough one. This is a tough one because. Because the 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 concept of um, a child passing away and going to heaven and being a child would not be held back by the constraints of their size. It would have no limitation on their abilities and capabilities because they'd be perfected. They'd be in this resurrected body. They'd be so. I mean, I tend to think we'll all be of an adult age. Of, of e even children that have died, I think we'll. I, I tend to agree with that theory. Mm -hmm. um, but. I mean, but there's nothing to say that it couldn't be that a, a, a child that looks very young acts and talks and has the same capabilities as someone that's much larger than them. You know, I mean, it's it's it, they won't be limited in this perfected state, in this resurrected body. They're not limited by the constraints that we see them as limited by in the bodies they're in now. So it, I don't know. And, and same thing for older people, Just just them being simply looking elderly – would have no bearing on their ability to function in their raptured bodies because they're perfected. So it, it I, I, I don't know. It, this is a, I could go either way with this one. I don't know. He also uh, cites Thomas Aquinas, the great medieval theologian, argue that we will all be the age of Christ when he was crucified, about 33. Aquinas pointed out human nature is deficient in a twofold manner in one way because it has not yet obtained its ultimate perfection and in a second way because it has already re receded from its ultimate perfection. Human nature is deficient in the first way in children and in the second way in the aged and therefore in each of these human nature will be brought back 
by the resurrection of the state of its ultimate perfection, which is in the state of youth, uh, toward which the movement of growth is terminated, and from which the movement of degeneration begins. So in other words, at your peak, you know, you reach a peak where you're growing and getting stronger and bigger, and you reach a peak, and then at that point, you know, you start to age and decline, you know? I, I, think, I think that that's just a conjecture, the whole thing. I yeah. have no idea. Nobody knows, but I would imagine that if there's shape shifting in heaven, then why couldn't you be in any state you want to be? Yeah, I was thinking that too. That you know, you. That's an interesting. Let's say, let's say like Austin. Austin's uh, grandfather uh, just passed away, and he was 94, right? Austin. He's somewhere. Hey, okay, yeah, well. correct. Sorry, the I have a microphone muted. Yes. Okay. Uh, so maybe. Since you know your grandfather at that age, maybe in heaven when you are interacting with him, he will appear to be 94 years old or 90 years old because that's the way you knew him. And uh, uh, But maybe somebody else who knew him when he was younger, maybe he will be at, appear at that age because that's how the age that they knew him. Well, I, we have to also think about pictures. Like we, we have pictures of them when they were younger, and I saw my grandpa, my grandfather, when he was younger. So I might. Yeah, but how about the people who don't have pictures and didn't know what their grandfather looked like when they were thirty years old? You know, and they, you wouldn't recognize them. Oh man, I'd love to surprise my grand great grandkids. <laughs> like you know, come to them at their age. You know, okay. hey, how are you? You know, what's going on? Oh, so you made it up here in the heaven too? You know, you know who I am. Yeah, yeah, I'm he's your also, great grandfather. <laughs> okay, he's also uh, referencing Hank Hanegraaff. Uh, hey, dog. Hank Hanegraaff suggests our DNA is programmed in such a way that at a particular point we reach optimal development from a functional perspective. For the most part, it appears that we reach this stage somewhere in our 20s and 30s. If the blueprints for our glorified bodies are in the DNA, then it would stand to reason that our bodies will be resurrected at the optimal stage of development by our DNA. Does this mean that children who go to heaven won't be children once they get there, or that, or that there will be no children on the new earth? Um, Isaiah chapter 11 speaks of an earth where the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf, and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy uh, on all my holy mountain. So uh, at least it looks like at the point there, there's going to be these uh, children uh, I think he makes the point, let me finish reading this point here before you guys comment then. Since the larger context of Isaiah is concerned with an eternal kingdom of God on earth, it seems inappropriate to restrict this passage to a thousand year kingdom that ends in rebellion and destruction of human beings. The end of sin and the complete righteousness of all earth's inhabitants won't come until the new earth. But if Isaiah 11 is speaking of the new earth, uh, as does its parallel passage in Isaiah 65, who are the infants and young children playing with, uh, playing with animals? Is it possible that children, after they're resurrected on the new earth, will be the same level of development as when they died? Now here's an interesting point. If so, these children would presumably be allowed to grow up on the new earth a childhood that would be enviable, to say the least. Believing parents then would presumably be able to see their children grow up and likely have a major role in their lives as they do so. This would fit something I'll propose later, that on the new earth, many opportunities lost in this life will be wonderfully restored. Although it's not directly stated, and I am therefore speculating, it's possible that parents whose hearts were broken through the death of their children uh, will not only be reunited with them, but will also experience the joy of seeing them grow up in a perfect world. That is a beautiful idea. That's interesting. I never thought of it that way before. Um, another way I used to think of it was, could the verse be talking about 
children that are in the millennium, um, who are growing up in the in the in the times of the millennium, not necessarily in eternity, but in in the millennium. Mm -hmm. Well, he did mention that, and, and he said that in the context uh, and, and the other cases, uh, it, it seemed to be pointing not to a uh, a millennium, but a, a new earth. But uh, either way, if, if it was a new earth, then you have children of the new earth. Uh, would they remain children, or would they grow up to a peak age and maintain that age 33? Uh, that would be wonderful. I mean, could you imagine the people who, let's say, lost children, uh, you know, at birth or in their early childhood, and they never had the chance to raise the children, and, uh, right. and they missed that opportunity? I, to me, that is a beautiful idea. I hope that is the case. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, it's also possible that on a new earth we will appear ageless. C.S. Lewis portrays this in The Great Divorce, saying of heaven's inhabitants, no one in that company struck me as being of any particular age. One gets glimpses, uh, even in our country, of that which is ageless, heavy thought in the face of an infant, and frolic childhood in that of an old man. You know, I have no idea what it's going to be like, or what, what the, our DNA is going to be like, but I really think it's going to be beyond physical. It's going to be beyond what we physically know. It's going to be more spiritual than that. So I don't know what exactly it's going to be, but I know that there will be eternal life in whatever shape we take. You know, I, I don't know if we, we should limit ourselves to the idea that it will be some sort of perfect DNA, some sort of perfect age. I really think that it's it's more of a spiritual uh, thing than, than 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 a body thing. Yeah, I, f I find it very interesting that even some of the uh, ancient theologians who've written on this they've been they've been speculating on this for centuries now, and that uh, they seem to think that we will be an thir thirty years old or thirty three years old or something in the prime of our life, uh, and yet if if we look at those verses that say they're going to be children, then the children maybe will be resurrected at, the, at that age and then grow to their uh, maturity. Uh, I, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. Mm. Uh, all right, uh, and let's, let's take this time now to just kind of recap anything that is, uh, you think is uh, significant enough to repeat, uh, and then we'll end this episode. We're going to pick up next time, chapter 30, and it, the question is, will we eat and drink on the new earth? Uh, does anybody stick anything stick out in your mind, Brother Austin? Is that you think uh, was well? That was interesting. I'd like to uh, em emphasize that. I just like the idea of the food, the new food that that will be there, and the ability to uh, enjoy it that that won't be taken away. And the truly the whole episode, the new sense or uh, the advanced senses, or maybe new senses in general, and. Just the wonderful experiences of what heaven will, will be like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there is a... Uh, this was really very interesting. To me, uh, we, starting in this episode, we're really getting into a lot of practical questions that a lot of people ask about heaven and wonder about heaven. Whereas before, it's been a lot much more um, esoteric type of I ideas. And... and uh, and now, you know, what age will we be? What about the children? What age will they be? Will we be eating? Will we have clothing? These are just real practical questions that a lot of people wonder. And so uh, I think this is, uh, we're getting into the really interesting part of the study. Um, Brother Eric, what, you, what stands out to you from the study today? I think a little along the lines of what you just said. You know, it's funny that anybody stumbling upon this particular video, I think would be a great video for people to stumble upon because in this one small series of questions, you can see how, you know, some people would think, well, this is an awful long time you're talking about heaven. But when you really, it just, in, just in these few questions that we talked about tonight, you can see what a big, how, what a dynamic this is and how much more there is to it than what you think when you really contemplate these issues and think about them. And I think you're really selling yourself short and you're not, um, you're not looking ahead and focusing on the things you're supposed to focus on, the heavenly things, if you just simply ignore these things and think, I don't have to worry about heaven, I'll, I'll, I'll worry about that when I get there. I mean, I think it's really, 
you're really selling yourself short on joy and what the possibilities could be. I think it brings you a, I know I know for me and you've mentioned it lots of times, Luke, it brings me a lot of joy to cover these topics. And there's so much more to it than just a very simple, well, we could talk about this for one episode and be done with it. No, I mean, it, it, there's so many facets of this. And it's really, it's really, it's really exciting to talk about and, and, and study with you guys. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Brother, uh, Brother Mitch, what, uh, uh, what sticks out in your mind besides the blimp? Well, spiders. Huh? Spiders, you know, having them. But I, I really think that the possibilities being endless, um, what's going to be in store for us, how we're going to be surprised, and how we're going to interact with one another are, are great questions. And we don't have all the answers, but it's great to speculate. It's great to think about, well, what are the possibilities of a place that God created for us? I, it's, that's that's got to be something that everybody should be thinking about, but they just don't. Yeah. Amen. Um, you know, what, so something to add real quick to what Mitch just said, and what he just said is great. I mean, because we're, we're sitting here and doing this in-depth talk about heaven, and with all the things we're covering over its 21 episodes now, we've only touched on things, and it's going to blow our mind be beyond what we're even imagining here right now. I mean, we're, we're doing the best we can to imagine how cool it's going to be and how wonderful it's going to be and how joyful it's going to be, and it's still going to blow our mind after this. <laughs> yes. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's where the verse says, no mind has conceived the... the what heaven's going to be like? I mean, we can tr we can ponder it, we can think think about it. the scripture tells us so much, but we've just scratched the surface, and we are going to be in awe. Uh, I think the, uh, the yeah this this study we we uh, really discussed so many interesting things. You know, our senses, uh, our uh, our food, uh, clothing, our bodies, the age will be, a marriage. You know. Sex, marriage, gender—all those things were discussed in this uh, study. So I think it was very, uh, very interesting. Uh, now, obviously, uh, maybe some people, uh, because of watching this video, they're getting excited about heaven, and uh, and they they say, "Well, I'm really excited about heaven now. I can't wait to get there." But my question to anybody is: first, is does everybody get to go to heaven? It's offered everybody. Okay, but does does everybody go to heaven? No. Okay. So the difference between the people who go to heaven and the people who don't get to go to heaven, uh, what is the distinction? Because we want people to know, uh, we don't want to be get all excited about heaven and then not not be able to go there because uh, they they didn't ever learn how. So what is the distinction? What is the difference between the people who are in heaven? And the people who are excluded end up end up in hell. What is the difference between them? Well, is it, is it I, I think it's about Earth. I think on Earth, what we need to be is miserable. We need to weep, mourn, and and that's absolutely not the message. The truth is, is that 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 we have a Savior, Jesus Christ, that opened the door wide open for us by His love. By dying for us and, and paying the price that that, that would that would, we could pay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the uh, a lot of people think if I ask them, "Are you going to go to heaven? Do you think you're going to go to heaven?" and they say, "Well, I think so." And I say, "Well, why?" They will tell me, "Well, because I I follow the golden rule, or I I uh, uh, give." I do charitable works. Uh, I go to church. I read the book of James. Yeah, whatever they, they do, they, they, they say, they say I think I'm going to heaven because I think I've been good enough. Maybe I deserve to go to heaven. Um, so uh, I don't sin as much like those other people, those really bad people. So um, is, the, is the difference between the people in heaven and the people in hell is... is uh, how much sin they did, or the types of sin they did? No. Yeah. Uh, are are the people in heaven and the people in hell 
equally sinners? Yes. So then what is the defining point, the distinction between those people in heaven and the people in hell? It all comes down to sinners saved by grace, by faith. Well, what about this verse when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is Jesus' claim of exclusivity. And this is a lot of people think, this is one thing that tends to offend some people. They don't like the idea that uh, not everybody in the world gets to go to heaven. And that, oh, how about all the good people that are not Christians? How about all the good Muslims? Oh, how about, the good, how about uh, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, and so on? They're good people. Uh, but Jesus said he was so bold to, that he claimed exclusivity. He says, you can't get into heaven except through me. I'm the way, the only way. So the difference between people in heaven and people in hell is the people in heaven are sinners just like the people in hell, but the people in heaven put their faith in Jesus, the only way to get into heaven. They put their faith in him. So what are we trying to tell these people here? That it is sin the issue, the determining factor for, to go to heaven or hell? Was sin the determining, determining factor? Sin, sin was the determining factor until it was paid for. Yeah, so sin is, no, sin is not the factor. A lot of people think that uh, whoever sins the most goes to hell and whoever sins the least goes, goes to heaven. But sin is not the issue because Jesus paid for everybody's sins on that cross. Sin is not the issue. Uh, there was a, a, sin was a barrier separating man from God, but Jesus paid the sins of the whole world on that cross. So now sin's not the issue. There's, but there is one issue, and what is it? What's the one issue that will determines if someone goes to heaven or hell? Faith in the Son. Jesus Christ. That's right. Jesus is the issue. What will you do with Jesus? Will you put your faith completely in him, or will you reject him and say, I'm going to do it my own way? Uh, scripture says that whoever believeth in the Son is not condemned. Whoever believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the Son of God. That's right. So when we believe in, the, in Jesus Christ for our salvation, we'll put our faith completely in him. He gives us eternal life. If we reject him as being the only way and decide to try to get there some other way, we end up in hell. That's the message we want people to understand, is that everybody needs Jesus Christ. We're not, you can't get into heaven any other way. You've got to put your faith completely in him. You've got to depend on him and reject the, fact, the, the possibility that you can get there some other way. That's right. Okay, so uh, just anybody who's watching this now, we're going to ask you, call on the name of the Lord. Say, Jesus, I believe you're the only way. Uh, you died for my sins. I uh, thank you for dying for my sins. Now will you give me eternal life because I, I, I'm trusting you. I'm, I'm depending on you completely. Then he'll give you eternal life and the promise of eternity in heaven. Anybody else want to add anything on to that before I, we close? I think it said sums it up. <laughs> okay, then uh, I'm happy to talk about heaven every every week. It's such a joyful topic, uh, and uh, I, we don't not neglect this most important part of the message is telling you how you go to heaven. The one way to get there is through Jesus. So if you do put your faith in Jesus today and you're going to receive this gift of eternal life, please make a comment on this video so we, we know about it. We'd love to celebrate. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.